Point on Youth here with Indessa in the Division for Social Policy and Development. And I'm also the uh, uh, chair of the Interagency Network on Youth Development here in the UN. Um, this is a very exciting program that we have over the course of the next three days. We'll have six Google Plus Hangouts. We will be um, organizing these in partnership with UN entities, the private sector, academia, and young people to discuss the priority areas of the Secretary General's system-wide action plan and his action agenda on youth. These uh, Google Plus Hangouts will take place at 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we welcome you to join us on, in each of these Hangouts. Uh, the priority areas that we'll focus on in these uh, Google Plus Hangouts are the areas that SG has identified, which are employment, entrepreneurship, political inclusion, citizenship and protection of rights, and then finally education, including on sexual and reproductive health. Um, one thing we're doing right now is we're developing the system-wide action plan, and we invite you to join us to learn more about the plan on www.un.org slash youth. And right now we have an online survey through August 15th, and we'd like to hear from you, young people um, around the world, what you'd like to see in the survey. And so, again, go on the website, and you'll see how you can join us and give us your input on the plan. So back to the Hangouts, um, we're not only going to be discussing the themes uh, identified by the Secretary General, but we do this in the context of partnership. The theme for this year's International Youth Day is how we can build better partnerships with and for young people. And that's what we'll be discussing here and over the course of the next three days. We want to have these Hangouts as interactive as possible, so we invite you to tweet in your questions to the panelists. You can go to the hashtag, hashtag um, IYD2012, and also go on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash youthgear. Send us your questions, and we'll try to get them to the panelists. So let's go ahead and get the ball rolling on the first uh, Google Plus Hangout. This is on the issue of youth and political inclusion. We've had the pleasure of working closely with UNDP in organizing this Hangout, and I am pleased to introduce the, the moderator. We're very lucky to have with us today Ms. Geraldine Fraser Molakete, who's the Director of Democratic Governance Practice in UNDP's Bureau for Development Policy, and she's also UNDP's focal point on youth. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Geraldine, who will introduce the session and the panelists. So let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Geraldine. Over to you. Thank you, Nicola, and thanks for that introduction that set the plane and reflected uh, UN Working as One, where we're looking at close collaboration in the area of youth and as we build up to International oh. Youth Day. I've got uh, a great panel here with me today, and I will start uh, with some introductions, and I'd want to say that we're quite honored to have with us uh, Sima Baus, who's the Assistant Secretary General of, uh, the, United, uh, of the United Nations Development Program and, and Director of the United, National, uh, United Nations Development Regional Bureau for the Arab States. Uh, Tima has got quite an uh, illustrious history and background, having most recently served amongst others uh, as head of the social development sector at the Arab League. She's also previously held positions uh, in a ministerial capacity in uh, government and uh, we can say lots about uh, uh, Sima, but I'll move on immediately and go on to um, Desmond at this point, who has just moved off the screen. So I'll proceed and go to Alex Worth, who's an advocate for youth involvement in government, community service, and service learning. He's also a fellow at the Forum for Youth Investment, we is leading the campaign for a presidential youth council aimed at institutionalizing youth voice in government. We also have Ritesh uh, Tina, who is the senior manager for corporate social responsibility with uh, um, uh, Mittal, uh, Arsela Mittal, uh, which is the world, world's leading steel and mining company. So he's actually re leading the business part of that. As we all know, they have a presence in more than 60 countries, and their global revenue since 2011 
amounted to about 94 billion US dollars. So we hope to have quite a robust engagement on uh, how we see the partnerships and interface. As was stated earlier, I'm Geraldine fraser Moliketti. I'm the Director of the Democratic Governance Practice of UNDP. I previously served as Cabinet Minister in uh, the government of the Republic of South Africa. I served in the cabinets of Nelson Mandela as the youngest cabinet minister at that point in time in 1996 and subsequently in two cabinets as minister for public service and administration. So as we talk about political inclusion, we will reflect on political participation this morning and political representation. And we look here not only at citizens in countries, but also look at marginalized groups, uh, look at uh, migrants, look at young people in difficult and complex uh, environments. And we hope to touch on the relationship between youth and political parties. And I think this morning promises to be a very engaging morning. To all of you out there, don't forget that you can access us on hashtag IYD for International Youth Day 2012 as we proceed. And I will immediately um, uh, start this discussion with, uh, at this point, uh, shall we look at you, Alex, because you're a staunch advocate of uh, uh, creating presidential youth councils or a presidential youth council at least in the United States of America. And we know that national youth councils have been established in many parts of the world in a number of countries. And there may have well been a concern previously that it's not inclusive enough. How do you suggest uh, that we um, ensure inclusivity in the creation of these councils that are intended to serve, after all, as the highest national platform for youth uh, to voice concerts? Of course. Well, thank you so much, Geraldine. And I have to say that I'm thrilled to be participating today. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been leading up the campaign at the Presidential Youth Council, and so we've spent a lot of time looking at different models uh, and trying to figure out how it is best to involve young people in government. I have to start off by saying that just because a body won't be inclusive enough uh, should not be an excuse for not doing it. Uh, and I think that you know we need to take some starting steps to really raising the platform and having more young people uh, and involved and included, you know, no matter what level of inclusion exists. However, I do think you bring up a very valid point, uh, and it's something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is how best to get more young people engaged and make it so that we have it and cast a wide as net as possible uh, so that as many different young people and as many different perspectives are included in those conversations. Uh, we've developed it uh, as we're proposing that the leadership of both the majority and the minority parties in the House and the Senate in the United States have the ability to appoint members to the Presidential Youth Council. We feel that that is very important to ensure that there's two different perspectives, one for more uh, of a Republican side and one for more of a Democratic side in terms of their appointees. But we really wanted to make sure, though, too, that you didn't have to be on the Presidential Youth Council solely for your political connections, but rather it was more about what you've done and what you've contributed to the community. And so what we're proposing is to have every single youth council in the United States have the ability to nominate one young person to serve on the Presidential Youth Council to create a pool of applicants the leadership in the House and Senate can then choose from. Uh, and just as a little bit of background, we have 400 youth councils in cities all across the United States uh, and over 20 at the statewide level. So our feeling was by creating that pool of really diverse and talented applicants and then having people that have come from two different political ideologi ideologies a point, we felt that that would best ensure that all voices were heard and there was a large amount. And how is this effort going right now, um, Alex? It has been going well. We have had five members of Congress on both sides of the aisle come out uh, and endorse our resolution, which was introduced in the House of Representatives two weeks ago. Uh, we had the White House Council on Community Solutions come out and endorse it. 
Uh, and just yesterday, I got a video clip of Valerie Jarrett, one of President Obama's senior advisors, saying that creating the Presidential Youth Council would be a good idea. So we've made some significant headway, but we're certainly not there yet and are going to continue to keep at it. Let me move from Alex uh, to a different part of the world. And I thought I'd go to you, Sima, because, um, well, both uh, you served as minister in different capacities in the Jordanian government. Um, you've come into our bus, you're from a region where we've seen youth participation in political processes and not necessarily the formal institutionalized processes only, but when we've looked at the squares, street, street uh, protests and all that, we are uh, getting a sense that there's strong evidence that suggests that youth are more inclined to participate in informal, politically relevant processes through avenues that include activism processes, protests, sorry, and campaigns. Do you want to reflect on this a little bit? Yes, uh, sure. Good morning, everyone. I am really very happy to be here on this Hangout. Uh, I, I welcome you all, and I bring you also the greetings of the uh, Arab Bureau for Arab States, so the Regional Bureau for Arab States, and also uh, perhaps on behalf of all the Arab youth, I bring you this morning a good greeting from this part uh, of the world that is seeing uh, major, uh, major uh, movements of Arab uh, youth that have, uh, as you have seen, have been able to influence political uh, transitions in the Arab world. Uh, we have seen the Arab Spring, which has been triggered in uh, general by youth, both men and women, and it has had a triggering force in promoting dr dramatic changes in a, in a society that has been uh, mostly, uh, in so many ways, uh, not open for uh, participation of youth in democratic processes and in political participation. We have also seen in the Arab world and after the Arab Spring how youth, both girls and boys, men and women, males and females, how they have been able to push the boundaries of what they thought was possible through political participation that is, as you said, Geraldine, is not uh, formal. They went to the streets, they went to the social media, they went uh, to different kinds of, uh, of expression, of, uh, of speech uh, and freedom of speech, etc., to be able to be political activists in their own uh, way. Also, uh, we have seen that um, there is a lot of commitment among youth now in the Arab world for democracy and for uh, and a major realization for the what is needed for democracy and political participation and inclusion in the Arab world, including uh, leadership skills, development of leadership skills. Uh, Arab youth have realized that, okay, the streets can have uh, demonstrations and there can be some change that happens, but there has to be some leadership for those streets so that we can really ensure that uh, youth are included in the political process and that the inclusion is as wide and as open as possible for youth. Also, another lesson that we have learned is the lesson of the importance of inclusion of women in political participation. This is a major issue, I think, that has come out from uh, the region uh, following the Arab Spring, is that uh, if you don't include women in the process, if there are no provisions for including women in the process of political participation and inclusion, then we are really only uh, empowering and democratizi democratizing half the society. This has come out to be very clear and we need to learn from the lessons of the Arab region in, uh, in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen, um, in all the countries that have underwent uh, this major political uh, uh, processes and political transition that women must have a part and we must really uphold the rights of women to be included in the processes of democratization. Also, we have learned from our uh, region uh, that uh, we have to keep an eye on the fact that democracy and inclusion must bring better quality of life for youth, for women, for men, uh, and it must also be equivalent to a growth, well-being, justice, and equality. All these issues uh, need to be further discussed and youth uh, in throughout the Arab uh, world and beyond, uh, we need to reflect on all these issues and see how best we can use them and employ them so that they can become 
uh, lessons learned for inclusion, for better inclusion, for better participation uh, by youth uh, throughout the world for a better quality of life, uh, including, as I mentioned, everybody. As you know, in the Arab world, youth constitute uh, over 50% of the population. They have uh, a number of uh, problems also, and or if we want to call them challenges that are, uh, are unmet yet. Uh, other than political inclusion that will be helped by political inclusion, which is unemployment, which is education. Um, the quality of education is not really meeting the demands of the market, and therefore there is a disconnect between economic prosperity and the education of youth in our part of the world. Also, uh, there is not enough um, information. Uh, although now the new media is, is providing avenues for that, but there is a lot of information still lacking on um, health, uh, on uh, issues related to youth, on the formation of how best they can deal with their lives, on rights, on, uh, on different issues that have to do with their uh, growing up, with their adolescence life, with their sexual life, with their uh, uh, all kinds of health uh, issues and reproductive health issues. Also, we have to be sure that uh, one of the lessons learned was that these all cannot be separated from, from each other. So when we want to work, uh, youth working on political inclusion, we'll have to address the different challenges that youth perceive and that youth feel are their challenges so that they become uh, more included in the process of socioeconomic development in, in their societies. Thanks. Thanks for that overview that brings together both the formal and the informal and precisely the point uh, that you raise around the importance of leadership and this has come through very strongly that uh, democracy and inclusion must ensure better quality of life and I think you, you, you raised the critical point that said that many of the unmet challenges will be assisted through um, inclusion, through political inclusion, and we're seeing that more and more. Now, Sima, there's a very difficult question that has been sent uh, on Facebook, and I thought you could help me with this one. Um, it says uh, the, the particular question actually raises concerns about how do we deal with uh, political inclusion of youth? Is it not important to consider reducing the age of candidacy for certain elections and in elections um, and, and combined with a reduced voting age? Do you think it would encourage youth inclusion in a political process? Now, I know this is a difficult uh, issue, but I thought that we should think about it. And I'll bring Alex in as well to comment. But uh, Sima, your initial thoughts, just some quick thoughts, and I'll move on this one. Yeah? Uh, my initial thoughts is that, uh, sure, if we uh, lower the age of candidacy uh, in the different countries, then of course, we will uh, end up having more youth involved in the processes. However, for us to be able to do that, there is a preparation that needs to be done, in particular for, uh, for youth, and in particular at schools, in education, and at universities, so that um, uh, people are, uh, or youth are ready, understand uh, what needs to be done, and understand the processes of democratization and the processes of political participation. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, until before the Arab Spring, not much, uh, not much attention actually was given to the agenda of youth in general, let alone uh, political participation as such, and let alone discussing the age even of uh, candidacy for elections or for parliamentary elections and otherwise. Now, uh, youth themselves have come to the foreground and have put <laughs> on the agenda, their issues, their inclusion priorities, and also the issue of wanting to participate formally in the um, election processes as such, and in ensuring that political participation is always vibrant and ready to take on the youth agenda. So yes, for, uh, for the reconsideration of age, uh, of age, and yes, also for preparing as much as possible schools 
and universities and informal education, civil society, families, uh, media to accept and to support and to promote the idea of youth inclusion in, in, in uh, formal uh, governance, if you want to say that, and participation. Alex, your thoughts, and I, I should tell you that in my country there's been a raging debate uh, over the past 10 years where there were various suggestions about reducing the voting age, uh, something that uh, I think uh, there was uh, traction from certain quarters, but others said just let's be careful. Your thoughts? Definitely. Well, I think the Assistant Secretary said it very well. Uh, and I'd have to agree with her, as I think it's something that should be done, but right now, in my opinion, I don't think we're ready at it. Uh, I know if you look at, you know, civic education in the United States, right now it's fairly dismal. Uh, and I think if we're going to work at lowering the voting age, we need to make sure we have a generation of young people who are willing to participate, who've got the background to it, and are really excited and enthusiastic. Uh, and if that's the case, then by all means we should. I know speaking in the United States, we face a pretty serious problem with youth voting. Uh, in 2008, we only had about 53% of young people vote, whereas seniors voted at a rate of 70 to 75% and adults voted at 60 to 65, which I realize is very low compared to the rest of the world. But even so, if we're only having young people vote at these lower rates, I think that we need a generation to show that we want to be involved and we want to be engaged uh, in voting before we go to such a large step as lowering the voting age. Uh, however, I would say that this shouldn't be seen as, as some sort of reason why we shouldn't be included just simply because we don't vote. Uh, and I think part of it yeah, is ensuring that young people have a voice and feel like they can participate and they can be heard. Uh, one of the things we found in some polling that we've done for the Harvard Institute of Politics is young people questioning whether or not their vote matters. Uh, and so I think it's important to send a really strong message to governments all across the world that young people do matter. Uh, and starting by including young people in just the formal bureaucratic process I think it's the first step on that longer path to lowering the voting age. So I think it's something that should be done, uh, but we're not ready for it yet, and we need to institute a couple of measures before we get there uh, and have my generation really show that we're ready to be active and engaged uh, and take every single opportunity that we have and also be provided with opportunities to get engaged and get involved. I, I like the fact that you touched on the issue of voter turnout and actual engagement by young people. Um, and we've looked at uh, the results of the survey of young America, Americans' attitudes towards uh, politics and public service uh, that was developed by Harvard by the Institute of Politics in April this year. Okay. Now, in terms of that, uh, there's an indication, as you pointed out, that young people are becoming increasingly disillusioned with engagement in politics, and your answer was a message to the governments globally. You think that's sufficient, or should, should we push a bit more, Alex? What else needs to be done? just not happy right now with the status quo, uh, and they don't feel like the system uh, is really supporting them. I think all you have to do is look at some of the youth unemployment rates. You know, here in the United States, our youth unemployment rates at about 16% double what normal adults are facing. Uh, and I know the same is true in, you know, countries, especially in Europe. Uh, I know Egypt had a fairly high youth unemployment rate as well as Spain. Uh, and so in looking at that, I think young people are feeling, well, not only can I not participate in the government, but I can't even find a job. Uh, and I think that that's tremendously concerning. So if we're going to work to start to change that, I think we need to bring young people in and really start reshifting the way we focus and think about young people. Uh, and in really stressing the whole need for entrepreneurship, having young people embrace their own ideas and really create startups and businesses. Uh, but also at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, we have to create a government that has young people in it and starting to think like that. Uh, I think we saw today with the Google Plus, you know, in setting it up, it was a very new technology, and so we spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. But with young people, you know, we're using these platforms every single day, and we're thinking about things in a different way, and so it can come easier for us. 
Uh, and unless we're really engaging young people in our government and have young people who are executing on these programs, they're simply just not going to be as effective and as efficient. So I think that's the first step of really shifting over the barrier and getting more young people uh, involved and engaged and making young people feel like the government is for them and it's working. Uh, and it's my hope that this will continue to help shift that stigma uh, and also make you know, more jobs and really get the economies back up and running and support young people. Now, Desmond, you've come in at a moment when we've been into this discussion uh, for a little while. Uh, just for the rest of uh, colleagues, Desmond is a youth activist from uh, Zambia. And he's currently the assistant coordinator of programs on civic participation, health and rights within Restless Development Zambia. Um, before we lose you, Desmond, and there's a lot I can say about you, I, I'd want to ask you directly, what are the activities in the realm of youth inclusion that you see as quite key to be transparent, um, that should be accountable, um, that should have a very strong rights component to it? And in terms of that, how um, do we ensure that in increasing relevance that they are linked to sectoral issues such as unemployment, uh, such as the environment, anti-corruption, um, challenges like HIV and AIDS, but to mention a few. How can civil society organizations and political parties work together to create an enabling environment for a youth participation that bridges the gap between community leaders and civil society organizations uh, with political leaders. Now I've asked you many questions and it's because we don't want to lose you so we just want to capture you there. Yeah? Over to you Desmond and welcome to uh, Google Hangout. We can't hear you, Desmond. Um, can you speak again? You still muted. We just waiting whilst that's being checked. Sima, I'll come back to you to actually ask you to just reflect a little bit around on uh, what's come out of the National Human Development Reports in recent years. What has though, have those reports in the Arab states in particular told us about youth and youth demands? Uh, well, thank you, Geraldine. This is a very important question, actually, and we are very, uh, uh, let's say, very, I don't want to say proud, but we're very actually proud that the Arab Human Development Report that was established by the United Nations and by UNDP and uh, also um, published uh, widely in the Arab world and beyond had uh, sort of uh, alerted uh, uh, different societies and different policy makers that youth, there is a bulge of youth in the region uh, at this point, there is a bulge of youth in the, in the world uh, also, and the needs for, um, for uh, policies and for uh, uh, all other uh, issues related to youth, to be more sensitive to youth, to be more friendly to youth, and to make sure that the, that the governments understand and know that reform, their reform agendas and their outlook for democratization and uh, better um, governance should include youth, otherwise there will be a major uh, outbreak by youth because as I mentioned earlier, they constituted uh, the highest number of uh, youth in the world, Arab youth, the, the highest percentages, as well as they have 
the highest unemployment rates, as well as they have uh, most uh, most of them, many of them have been connected to the to the world, and they understand and they have uh, sort of ambitions to have better quality of life in general. So um, the alerts that came from the Arab Human Development Report regarding uh, the the need for better education the need for better uh, socioeconomic uh, opportunities, the need for employment, the need for creating jobs, the need for more involvement by civil society towards youth. All these uh, issues were handled and um, studied by the Arab Human Development Report and were promoted as uh, alerts, uh, so to speak, to policymakers and to others on how best to handle so, this. So, Sima, those uh, human development reports very clearly pointed to the importance of political inclusion. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, within it. And is there any one or two last issues before we try this month once again? Uh, I think one of the the other issues that we really uh, need to look uh, to look at is uh, the issue of unemployment for youth that has been uh, uh, targeted by a number of Arab human development reports and pointed out to as one of the major issues that needs to be tackled and uh, and uh, addressed uh, also entrepreneurial skills for uh, for youth as I mentioned earlier uh, education uh, that uh, brings about uh, youth in the Arab world that are not really uh, capable of joining the, the economy, of not being able to have better jobs and to have jobs in general, have also prompted a number of Arabs, uh, and this was also uh, referred to in the Arab Human Report, have prompted a lot of Arab youth to want to migrate outside of their countries and to leave their countries and try to find better opportunities outside for better livelihood. Also, I think one of the issues that were, was always uh, highlighted by the Arab Human Development Report is the fact that we are not giving enough attention to uh, youth organizations and to empowering uh, youth to have their own organizations and their own voices so that they can sit on uh, policy making uh, bodies in the Arab world and so that they can make their voices heard on their, on their needs and on their aspirations. Also, uh, policies were in so many ways referred to and shown and alerted to in the Arab Human Development Report that they were not uh, youth friendly, they were not poor friendly, they were not uh, policies that, uh, in, uh, that uh, encouraged inclusion of youth in, in general. So all these issues have been uh, highlighted in the Arab Human Development Report and warned against in the Arab Human Development Report. I think what we saw in the Arab Spring on the streets of, um, of Cairo, uh, in the streets of Tunis, in the streets of Libya, was one way of youth themselves uh, finally having the, the platforms to express themselves and to express that they are there, that they have needs, and that if their needs are not met, they're going to take on their destiny with their own hands. And this is something that was quite inspirational for the whole world, and I think uh, uh, important to, to note. And uh, I think now Desmond is back uh, with us. So yes, I think so. Thanks very much, uh, Sima. I just want to remind everyone, we are on hashtag y IYD, International Youth Day, IYD 2012. Desmond, we asked the question, I asked the question earlier, and I'm going to go to the last part. How can civil society organizations and political parties work together to contribute to an enabling environment framework for youth participation that breach community leaders and civil society organizations? Now, when I talk about political parties, I also obviously talk about government and about parliaments. Over to you, Desmond. Let's hope that this time you come through. Desmond? We, uh, you can proceed. Okay, Desmond, there's still a problem with your sound. I'm not sure whether your microphone is on mute or not. Will you check that? No, it's not on mute. Uh, I think our operation center that's trying to look at it has ensured that the YouTube broadcast is on. Uh, 
for this month uh, is uh, it seems it could be on okay um, this month once more still nothing okay we're having a bit of a challenge we have uh, tried to get uh, um, youth representatives from all continents all regions and as you can see, this new technology is not just about age, Alex. Uh, <laughs> it's also just about broadband in instances. So we may have had uh, people cut off because there's issues around the broadband, there's issues around microphones and so on. We had hoped to have someone here from Latin America and the Caribbean but again, because of time constraints, didn't manage to get that together. So we'd want you to bear with us. Um, Desmond, can we try once more? Can you just check that your microphone is unmuted? Oh, you there. Speak a little louder. We can hear a soft sound, Desmond. This is when you need a rally voice out in the community, in the sticks and on the barricades. Can you speak a bit louder? Um, you are muted now because that was a close one. Can you try again? Unmute it. We've got technical people from all sides here and we're still trying the magic. Alex, let me come back to you at this point. Tell me what was the greatest challenges as you were lobbying to try and get this youth council on the agenda and especially reaching a point when you have uh, five from each side of the aisle. We're still going to go back to Zambia. Africa will still be able to have a voice. So carry on, Desmond. Of I'm course, sorry, and Desmond, uh, Alex. And Desmond, feel free to interrupt me if you're able to get your mic to work. We'll look very much from hearing from you. Uh, the greatest challenge that we have faced, uh, and simply with the meetings with the, around the Presidential Youth Council, and we've done about 50 of them uh, in offices on both sides of the aisle on Capitol Hill with members of Congress and their staff, uh, was simply getting adults who understood the power of young people and who were willing to really say, look, these are young people that we should be elevating and put into uh, a role with a lot of responsibilities. One of the most common replies that I often get is, well, I have a 15 or 16 year old and I can't even get them to make their bed in the morning, so why should we put them uh, as a member of the Presidential Youth Council? Uh, and so what I've had to say with that is, you know, often I neither, neither do I make my bed in the morning. <laughs> um, but what we have to do is look at what young people are doing in their communities each and every day. And I think if you look all across the globe, young people are participating in change every single day and they want to make an impact. Uh, and whether or not it's a small community service project in their school, whether or not you know, it's changing the way their village or their town does uh, political inclusion or addresses a certain issue, or whether or not it's changing countries with the fantastic examples of national youth councils, we really have to stress the amazing things that young people have been doing at all these different levels of government and provide those direct examples uh, and allow that to be heard and allow that to really make our argument and push that through. Thank you. You know, whilst we wait for uh, Desmond to come in, um, there has been a question raised on what would uh, we envisage, uh, I'm just uh, trying to get, how, what would the U UN Charter for Youth look like if it was rewritten today? And I thought I would take us to, um, uh, you know, the fact that there is a declaration on the promotion among youth of the ideals of peace, mutual respect, and understanding between people. And this goes back to 1965. And it says there, um, it recalls that in the Charter, the U United Nations had affirmed its faith in the fundamental, in fundamental human rights and the dignity of the human person and the equal rights of men and nations. It also reaffirmed the principles embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
the declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, and so it goes on. But it states that in recalling that the purpose of the United Nations educational, scientific, and cultural organization is to contribute to peace and security by promoting collaboration among nations through education, science, and culture, and recognizing the role and contribution of that organization towards the education of young people in the spirit of international understanding, cooperation, and peace. And it was convinced that young people wish to have an assured future and that peace, freedom, and justice are among the chief guarantees that the desire for happiness will be fulfilled, bearing in mind the important part played by young people in every field of human endeavor and the fact that they are destined to guide the fortunes of ma mankind. Now that linked into the discussion earlier, and Sima had actually raised the whole issue around the importance of leadership moving forward. You, Alex, have raised importance about recognition of the role of youth, much as you said, look, no need to lower voting age, uh, and so on. There, there's a need to review it. What more should come out? Uh, is there something more? And I haven't even uh, mentioned all the principles, because there are um, at least six principles that are enshrined in this declaration on the promotion among youth of ideals of peace, mutual respect, and understanding between people. And it talks about um, uh, questions of peace, justice, freedom, and so on. It continues and talks about uh, international solidarity and so on. And it talks very importantly about young people being brought up in the knowledge of the dignity and equality of all men without distinction as to race, color, ethnic origins, or beliefs, and in the respect for fundamental human rights and for the right of peoples to self-determination. Now, this is also about inclusion and what we're looking at today. So, Disney, can we try? Can you come in at this point? Your microphone is not working, Desmond, if it's not unmuted. I, I think that's what it is. Um, back to you, Alex. Of course. Well, I think you bring up a really, you know, excellent point. And, you know, I think if you look at the UN Charter, there's a lot of very valuable words and messages in there, and I think really great values that all generations stand by. I think the question that we have to consider is how we've implemented those values. Uh, and I think the next step on political inclusion and specifically youth engagement is ensuring that we're providing pathways and opportunities for young people to start to work to implement some of the concepts and values uh, that are talked about in the UN Charter and in the work of UNESCO. You know, I think the work of the UNESCO Youth Forum is a fantastic example of bringing young people together from all of the, over the world to sit down and talk about the issues that really matter and get a sense of each other's cultures. But I think one of the things that's really important, something that the UN needs to be doing, the governments all across the country need to be doing, uh, and that local you know, villages and municipalities need to be doing, uh, is encouraging young people to solve some of these problems and really take a stand and talk about uh, the values that matter and what is so important. Uh, and this is what I like to call youth engagement. You know, I think there's two different things. I think you can do youth outreach and you can do youth engagement. Uh, youth outreach is what we're doing today. Is we're putting out a message to young people. We're saying, look, it matters. You and cares about young people. Youth engagement, on the other hand, is empowering young people to really start taking on projects and making the case uh, and really being leaders in their own communities. And so uh, I think there's definitely, you know, we can talk about voting. We can talk about political inclusion, creating those opportunities. But we also need to be creating campaign plans and we need to be creating project ideas. Uh, and the recognition systems of those projects so that every single person uh, can have the ability to log in and go online or receive a text message with information and start taking action in their own communities because that, I think, is really the gold standard uh, of youth engagement and how our generation is going to take the values of the UN Charter uh, to an even higher level. Yeah. 
Thanks, Sima. Um, the, when we look at the charter and the thoughts that's come up from Alex as well. Um, thank you, Alex, for bringing up the fact that we should engage youth, uh, not only uh, outreach, do outreach programs. I think there are a number of uh, of issues in the charter when we, when we talk about uh, justice, about quality of life, about uh, um, you know there are so many collective dreams and aspirations for all youth uh, around the world that we can work on in terms of engagement. I think there are a number also of projects which you uh, you have uh, alluded to uh, that I want to highlight here. Uh, the United Nations, for example, with its different uh, organizations, is doing a number of grass, uh, grassroots, bottom-up uh, engagement of youth in certain um, areas uh, uh, in the Arab world and, and beyond, actually. I have witnessed uh, at least two very major uh, good experiences. One is being conducted by UNDP Arbas in Egypt now, where youth are engaged in, uh, in, the, in the villages, in the communities themselves. They go out. They assess the uh, needs of the of the village or the community. They they do their surveys on their own. They discuss them and then they take them up to the level of uh, the municipality or the district where forums are done and discussed on what the needs are, what could be done, how they can be engaged, how they can also influence policy, and then uh, these decisions go up even further to the uh, national level where they are uh, being discussed with other community youth leaders from different uh, communities and they are uh, mainstreams eventually in projects and in policies in Egypt. I have also been involved throughout my, uh, throughout my career in other uh, areas around the world, in, uh, in, in Asia, uh, in Thailand, in, uh, in Jordan, in the villages everywhere where you just go to the villages and have the uh, youth councils work on identifying their needs, work on including men and women, girls and boys in identifying what the needs are, what the immediate needs are, how they can, how they can assess those needs, and then discuss them in fora at the, at the district level and at the village level before they go up higher into the political process. This, I think, is one of the ways of involving youth, engaging youth not only in politics as such for politics sake but rather where we say if we say that the development is comprehensive development should be integrated so social economic uh, cultural political development becomes part and parcel of the life of a uh, of youth in different areas of uh, of the of the countries of the world of the villages of the of the municipalities of the districts. So this is one way of engaging youth. Of course, now today, with the advent of, um, of social media, youth can be so much more also uh, connected with each other, sharing their, their needs and aspirations, talking about them, discussing them. And then we, as, um, as uh, people helping them or as people wanting to engage youth and believing in the collective power of youth, we should be able to make sure that they are mainstreamed, their thoughts, their ideas, mainstreamed up, up, up towards the major policies so that the, the youth agenda continues to be on the highest agenda of national development. And when I say national development, I mean social, economic, political uh, development that takes into consideration all the needs that are identified by youth themselves at certain at certain times, and I think this is one of the major ways of involving youth. Also, keeping youth always listening to them and keeping an ear for making sure that institutions of youth are being supported, that laws and regulations for institutions of youth coming up and organizations and NGOs and whatever are supported and mainstreamed also in the political process of any country. This is very important too, to look at what the youth are doing today, but to keep an eye on the future uh, path of youth and how we want them to be mainstreamed in our uh, developmental processes if we're talking about political participation and political development. There is another way, one, uh, one issue that we need to look at is the idea of social responsibility and volunteerism which youth can play a major part in. There are many entrepreneurs now in the world that are youth and that are coming out with experiences, uh, with social responsibility as well. I can quote a number of examples from the Arab region where young men have, have done very well in entrepreneurial skills and have immediately gone out to outreach for youth to bring them into the process of 
deciding on socio-economic political uh, development in their countries, as well as ensuring that youth in certain communities, in poor communities, in needy communities, or just in communities that could help other communities are really involved in uh, something like that. It starts with a kick or a support from an entrepreneurial uh, person who believes in social responsibility, in volunteerism, in youth, and then we can kickstart a, a major process of including the population of uh, the world youth in development. And I think this is key. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sima. You know, in terms of the various comments that have come through since we've been on this Google hang Hangout, there were two that I want to lift. The one is that there was clearly an affinity to the distinction between youth engagement and youth outreach and the importance of that. There was also a, a very strong draw to the reference on the importance of education. We know that at this particular point in time, globally, youth are more educated than ever before. However, we know that there are also a very large number of youth that are undereducated and that are uneducated. And there is a need to overcome that because after all, education also contributes towards power. And as was indicated earlier, if we talk about political inclusion, it's also about the ability of youth to take charge. So it's about the concept of nothing about youth without youth. There was also a challenge that was thrown out on the social media that says to address, you, to address youth engagement and inclusion, shouldn't the United Nations hire more youth? Now, I do want to say that indeed that's correct, but there are a number of youth that are within the UN, if you look at the broad definition, I think the big challenge is, well, what is more visible in terms of the profile? And I leave you to be the judge of that. But I want to continue with this by stating that as we draw this Google uh, Hangout to a close, and as the countdown goes on to International Youth Day, which uh, is going to be on us soon, on the 12th of August. We note, as was indicated by uh, Nicola of UNDESA earlier, that this is part of a week-long commemoration that leads up to International Youth Day, that leads up to the 12th of August. And the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the United Nations Development Program has invited everyone to join us to online dialogues over these days. And today was, a first, was one of those dialogues. And I'm sure we, there's a number of lessons for us we can do better. We had uh, speakers lined up from Europe, from the Nordics in particular. But unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, they were unable to join us. India, which is from the larger Asia-Pacific region, unfortunately got cut off line because that's where we had the private sector link. And we had uh, um, someone who was the senior management for corporate social responsibility who was online with us for a few minutes. And then we had Desmond from Africa who unfortunately we could not hear. We can see Desmond, but there was a challenge with his microphone throughout. Um, we had uh, fortunately had the benefit of Sima uh, Bahus, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the UN and Director of the United Nations Development Program, the Regional Bureau for the Arab States, and she was able to join and reflect on the Arab states. Then North America and the United States, we had Alex Wirth, an advocate for youth involvement in government, community service, and service learning. Um, and as I indicated earlier, we had a bit of a challenge with Latin America and the Caribbean. But we are certain this being the first 
we will and have learned from this particular Google hang Hangout and we'll take it forward. What's also important <laughs> is to remember uh, the need for intergenerational dialogue and we had a little bit of that today. Um, Sima and myself uh, see ourselves still as young at heart Sima and I think if you look at the different moments of engagement we were very clearly out there at a particular point and part of change and agendas that would make a difference contributing towards political inclusion dealing with glass ceilings both in terms of being young people at a given point but also being women and having to break through in terms of that so I want to conclude this Google Hangout by saying that we go back to the charter as reminded by us and uh, reminded by one of the people on social media, one, yeah, one of the young people, where they said, let's look again at what the UN Charter should look like. And I'd want to say that there are certain principles of that charter that are profound and are still relevant. And as was indicated by Alex, the challenge is about implementation. Are we within the UN system? Are the youth of the world, the peoples of the world, ensuring that we implement what we have committed ourselves to? Are we ensuring that young people are brought up in the spirit of peace, justice, freedom, mutual respect and understanding in order to promote equal rights? for all human beings and all nations, economic and social progress, disarmament and the maintenance of international peace and security. Are we ensuring that all means of education, including as of major importance, the guidance given by parents or family, instruction and information intended for, young, for the young, should foster amongst them the ideals of peace, humanity, liberty and international solidarity and other ideals which help to bring peoples closer together and acquaint them with the role entrusted to the United Nations as a means of preserving and maintaining peace and promoting international understanding. And cooperation and I think that's profound. It's still important because I think what's quite critical is ensuring that there is the fostering of these ideals, that we bring together everyone in the spirit of peace, justice and understanding and of course the question of dignity and equality of all people. So as we dealt with political inclusion today, as we looked at inclusion and participation, we touched a bit, uh, but we touched but the tip of a much bigger discussion. But we have the tool to take this forward, and we do so as one UN family, irrespective of where we're located. We do so as the peoples of the world intergenerationally, and we do this as young people in the different parts of this world. And we do so as we look towards a post-2015 agenda with a commitment to sustainable development and sustainable human development. So I'd want to thank you all for participating today. And thank uh, Nicola and UNDESA and the youth uh, interagency structure for ensuring that we make this happen because there will be more to come. So thanks very much today. You. Thank you, everybody, and uh, it's really it's a learning experience and an interesting discussion this morning. A as you know, we had some technical problems this morning. Uh, this has to do with the internet all over the world. You know, it's not always as secure as we're lucky to have it here in our UN offices in New York. Um, what you haven't seen behind the scenes here in New York, while all of this is happening, the discussion is happening. We've been calling the participants and trying to get them online and trying to get the technology to work, but um, we haven't been able to get everybody going. I'm pleased to see that anyway we were able to have a, a very um, vibrant discussion this morning. Just so you know, this is the first of UN DESA's uh, Google Plus Hangouts. I want to again thank Geraldine and her team at UNDP for the great partnership on this Hangout. And, uh,
in the afternoon we have another hangout. The, it'll be 2 p.m. Eastern time. And on this uh, hangout, UN DESA has worked with UN Habitat. So over the next three days, uh, we have six hangouts with different UN partners. And we'd like you to join all of those and uh, take part in that. And also, please tell us what you're doing for International Youth Day. Go on our Facebook. Tell us what you're doing. We have a map on our website. We're highlighting everything happening all over the world. So thanks again, and I'm going to conclude the Hangout. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all participants. And sorry, Desmond. Thank you. <laughs>